Good evening and welcome again to the historic John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum tonight. My name is Eric Jemba. I'm a junior of Quincy House studying environmental science and engineering along with government. I hail from the great state of New Jersey and I'm honored to serve as one of the co-chairs of the Fellows and Study Groups program, what we like to call FSG, this year. And my name is Kareen Hajar, the other co-chair of FSG. I'm from Milton, Massachusetts and a junior in Elliott House studying government, data science and economics. Eric and I are excited to tell you a little bit more about our six amazing fellows and the program we fondly call the hidden gem of the IOP. FSG is truly special. Where else can you learn from a magazine editor, organize with an activist, and bake cookies with the senator all in one week? These opportunities are singular on Harvard's campus, and we encourage all students of all interests and backgrounds to apply to be liaisons in order to experience the mentorship and friendship that has changed so many lives. That's exactly right. And each semester here at the IOP, we host a diverse cohort of fellows who teach and mentor, but also learn from students across the Harvard community while they're here. Residential fellows live on campus and lead students in political discourse by way of their weekly study groups. For me, it's been the liaison team dinners with Latasha Brown of Black Voters Matter and explaining unorthodox Harvard traditions to Mayor Andrew Gillum that have defined the FSG experience. This is a program rooted deeply in the power of student voices and we welcome all of you to add your voices to it this semester. We look forward to using this semester's diverse topics to welcome groups on campus that the IOP has yet to reach. Public service is not specific to those who look a certain way or study a certain topic. It takes a multitude of perspectives to solve the, the issues that are all around us. FSG is a space for students to explore politics in all its forms and to step out of their comfort zones. For instance, as a chief of staff to Congressman Curbelo, I was able to bring liberal students to the table with the conservative congressman to talk about climate change. We hope that these conversations humanize the opposition. We hope that students leave this space with the assumption of best intentions. In short, we hope to heal the divides that plague the nation. So, without making you wait as long as the Iowa caucuses, let's present our spring 2020 class of fellows. We ask that you hold your applause until the end. We're fortunate to have our conversation moderated tonight by the IOP director and interim Winthrop House faculty dean, Mr. Mark Guerin. Our first fellow has spent two decades navigating media and policy in the nation's capital and is the co-founder of the Beat DC, a platform intersecting national politics, policy, business, media, and all people of color. We're glad to be joined by Ms. Tiffany Cross. His diplomatic career spans over 40 years, primarily focusing on national security issues and European policy, while serving as the British Ambassador to the United States, National Security Advisor to Prime Minister David Cameron, Permanent Representative to the European Union, and EU Advisor to Prime Minister Tony Blair. We're glad to be joined by Lord Kim Derrick. He is the former Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director of Resilience Policy on the National Security Council staff, and over the past 15 years has helped author, author a wide variety of plans, policies, and doctrine to foster resilience through effective risk management. We're glad to be joined by Mr. Mark Harvey. She's a senior advisor to U.S. Senator Kamala D. Harris, having most recently served as chief of staff in her Senate office and to her presidential campaign, Kamala Harris for the People. We're glad to be joined by Ms. Rohini Kosoglu. She is a pragmatic, tell it like it is conservative, CNN political commentator, ABC News political contributor, and former GOP communications director on Capitol Hill. We're glad to be joined by Ms. Tara Setmeyer. And he is an attorney and businessman who served as the 11th governor of Alaska from 2014 to 2018. He was only the second governor born in Alaska, and he was the only independent governor in the nation during his term. We're glad to be joined by Governor Bill Walker. And to all of our fellows, welcome to Harvard. Well, good evening, everyone. And first, Eric and Karine, thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership with the fellows. 
committee and your fellow committee members in a special way. Let me thank our colleague Abby James, our coordinator for the Fellows Program. So this is a great opportunity for you to get to know this year's class of uh, resident fellows, as Eric and Crean well laid out. It's a really extraordinary group of folks who've committed themselves to public service and public purpose, and so we hold them out with great uh, respect for their lives of consequence that they've led and the interesting ideas that they will bring uh, to the study group. So tonight's a chance for you to get to know them a little bit better, for you to ask them questions once we come to that point of it, and to, to, to really have uh, the opportunity to think more about some of the issues and um, perspectives that they will bring to their study groups, the office hours, and all the ways that our resident uh, fellows animate um, the Institute of Politics. Uh, but first, I'm looking at a former uh, interlocutor right here on the stage. We are thrilled uh, to welcome um, to the Kennedy School in this capacity as an Angelopoulos Global uh, Fellow here, uh, the longest serving finance minister from Nigeria, uh, Dr. Ngozi Okojo Iwela, who joins us from your service, um, as I said, as the longest serving finance minister in Nigeria, but also your work in the World Bank, uh, having delivered a very thoughtful lecture uh, last year, but we're warmly welcoming you back as the Global Fellow here. Doctor, thank you so much for being here. Well, we have so much to cover here. Iowa, the State of the Union, New Hampshire, we have the right group of people with all of you to uh, dissect this and unpack some of the, the news that uh, we've all been witnessing just in the past few days. So let me jump right into it. And Rahini, maybe I could start with you. Uh, because a few months ago, you were all set to be in Iowa on Monday with Senator Harris's campaign. Uh, as was noted, you were the chief of staff in her Senate office. You prepared her for the Senate run and then chief of staff in her campaign. Um, but you were here at the Institute of Politics on Monday. Uh, and so talk with us about the Iowa caucus, what you saw, were there surprises? I mean, obviously the process, but how you see uh, this week coming up into sure. New Hampshire as sure. well, the landscape of of the campaign. Well, this was all part of the plan so that I could do the fellowship there you go. Yeah. <laughs> here. Yes, securitous um, plan, yes. <laughs> right. um, well, I think, you know, for all of you that were watching, um, there's the Iowa that night was extremely complicated for so many people. And while so many of us were watching the results coming in or not coming in um, at the same time, uh, you know, two things were happening. One, which was the bubbling up of this conversation about whether Iowa should continue to be the first state, you know, for the Democrats to have to have that conversation that has been bubbling up every four years. And, and the feeling about the caucus process, who was it benefiting, were we, you know, really as a party, you know, uh, doing the right things moving forward. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to recognize that just the tremendous amount of effort all these different campaigns had put in for the last one year. And so you had just young people from across the country that had moved to Iowa, um, people that, you know, um, had leases and were just basically wor working passionately on behalf of somebody, young and old, volunteering, knocking on doors, making phone calls. And the frustrating part about this whole thing has been a lot of their work, um, you know, came to a resolution that is clearly muddied by just the timing and the momentum that candidates hope to bring from it. And so certainly a lot of campaigns have all moved to New Hampshire and they're moving forward and trying to figure out, okay, who's riding this momentum wave and certainly, um, you know, Mayor Pete and Bernie and, you know, Warren are all, you know, moving forward and, and with the Biden team trying to reinvigorate their team as well. Um, but I do think that, you know, it's certainly frustrating for so many people that were on the ground there. And I think um, we also have to acknowledge, too, just the amount of dedication and calendars and, and scheduling that has to happen for these candidates to essentially live in Iowa. You know, it's certainly in the last quarter of the race. Um, but I think moving forward, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see also when, um, 
you know, Mike Bloomberg gets involved in the Super Tuesday mm -hmm. aspect of it and what that means um, as all of these things collide while this while the party is having the same conversation about, um, you know, what this means for Iowa and New Hampshire as the first states and, and the momentum as going into Super Tuesday. So, Mark, a few months ago, you were on the White House staff and uh, your study group here will focus on election <coughs> security issues. Iowa obviously had a few election Hiccups. security issues. <laughs> what was your reaction to, to that and how do you analyze the uh, challenges that the app had and what this means for election security going forward? Uh, well, first, it, it always shows why we're nervous when we hear somebody say, hey, there's an app for that. Uh, you know, when you look at uh, the driving factors behind this, uh, a lot of times there's an over-reliance on technology. And uh, this is a story that we've seen time and time again uh, in a number of government agencies in a number of private sector ventures where the focus is on the tech and on how fast things can be done. Uh, and you always have this triad, good, fast, and cheap, and you can pick two of the three. Uh, and in this case, it seems fast and cheap uh, were what were chosen and we suffered with good. But it also really highlights the interdisciplinary nature and the need for partnership across this, this range of issues because we have technology problems, uh, we have process challenges. In a lot of ways, this now comes down to a crisis communications challenge for the Democratic Party of Iowa. I think they can probably sympathize with the, the former Boeing CEO now. They're going through the same thing, a quick adaptation of a new technology that was untested, that did not involve their core constituency, that has now failed in a very public fashion, uh, and now their currency is their credibility and they are cashing in on that very quickly. And so they need to start to learn from some of those crisis communications techniques, be much more transparent so that they can ensure fidelity and integrity in these results uh, as they move forward. Uh, and I think that is a lesson that uh, other parties uh, in other states are gonna start to learn now. Hmm. Ambassador Derek, let's bring in a <coughs> global perspective here, your own. Homeland has had issues, and indeed what your study group will focus on is populism broadly and globally. As you look to the United States um, and some of the issues we're having in the 2020 election, how do you reflect on our, our current electoral process and some of the issues that we've had? The first thing, first thing to say, Mark, is that it is just as different as it possibly could be from the way we do elections in the UK. Hmm. Our elections, take about six weeks, and yours take sort of 18 months, or maybe I'd say it's a bit longer than that. Each candidate in our elections for each constituency is allowed to spend about $1,200. I think you spend a little more here. <laughs> um, no, I didn't and <coughs> then you have, I mean, our elections all held on, you know, the same day you have this primary system, which is just wonderful theater. And I've been following American politics all my life, and there is just something quite extraordinary and gripping about it. But you get the Iowa caucus, and it's this, this extraordinary mixture of a sort of wonderfully archaic system of people gathering in community centers, then dividing up into different corners of the room, and then the high technology of the app that uh, didn't work. So it's, it's just um, a fascinating thing to watch. Um, I was lucky enough when I was ambassador here to meet all of the main candidates, and they're all very impressive politicians, I promise you, and formidable in different ways. I have a soft spot for Mayor Pete because I went down to South Bend, Indiana last year in about May or June. I spent several hours with him, longer than was scheduled because he took me around the South Bend to show me all the redevelopment projects, and um, we then ended up in a in a wonderful bar which sold local craft beer, so it was a very good day. But um, went pubbing, <laughs> yeah. So um, so I'm kind of you know personally I, I, I think he's he's a he's an exceptional politician um, uh, and amazingly talented, and to be where he is coming from a city of ten thousand people um, uh, to win the Iowa, if he did, um, I think what seventy percent of the votes are in. It's pretty amazing, and you know, congratulations to him. But I have no idea what will what will emerge at the end of the whole thing. Um, uh, and I'm kind of sorry. I mean, it's fascinating to be here, and it just reminds me of just what an extraordinary process it is. 
I went to the conventions last time I was here in 2016, the Republican Democrat conventions. I'm sorry we're missing those because they're great events too. But look, it's the most wonderful theatre. And you are electing a leader of the free world. So we kind of feel we Brits should have a vote as well. And, you know, if you'd like to think about that next time round, we'd be <laughs> grateful. But, um, but look, it's, um, you know, as I say, it's, uh, it's a fascinating thing to watch and um, I can't wait to see it unfold. Tiffany, let me bring you in. Your study group will look at representation in media. And as you look at this electoral cycle or perhaps last night's State of the Union, what calls out to you as some of the things that you've been working on with BTC yep. and as you think about your study <coughs> going forward? Um, well, first, thank you everybody for being here. I'm so excited to be here and Mark has the coolest job ever. So uh, very happy to participate here. Um, uh, for me, I think it's so dangerous how much power <coughs> the media has. I mean, members of the media are frequently arbiters of information. And so um, when I'm hiring people and I ask, you know, a lot of younger people who come in and interview and I say, well, how do you get your news? And consistently, most of them will say, well, CNN or MSNBC or Twitter. Uh, which scares me because that means a lot of people aren't reading papers. And this uh, landscape, this news landscape, is grossly lacking in diversity. That's reflected in the last 24 hours, right? We have centered Iowa that does not look like the rising majority of America. We have elevated this, this state, um, the small number of people in a state, um, as kingmakers of, of, you know, who will lead our democracy. And so that can unintentionally send the message that, well, people who look like me or members of the Asian American Pacific Islander um, community, who's the fastest growing demographic in America, um, the Latino community who will eclipse black voters in terms of eligible voters for the first time this year, they can all get the unintended impression that their votes don't count, that their voices don't count. And so uh, I think the media has grossly failed our democracy, when you whitewash the American experience, you are killing democracy at the same time. And so it was devastating to me to see the State of the Union last night, and it wasn't immediately followed with fact-checking. I mean, I lost count after five minutes into this speech. And this doesn't have to be a partisan issue, this has to be somebody who cares about truth and uh, accountability, and the media has, has, you know, kind of failed in uh, both senses, and so, um, you know, even the, you know, it's not always about the faces you see on TV, but it's about the representation and decision makers. Because you also had a lot of people saying, how amazing, you know, Donald Trump was presidential and he's making these inroads with communities of color. I'm sorry, he also, you know, crowned Rush Limbaugh, a, a known racist and who says awful things and who's an opponent of the feminism movement. Um, and crown this person as, you know, someone to be celebrated, but the media missed that, you know? I mean, they talked about it, but it was paled in comparison to let's celebrate and normalize the craziness that we're seeing. So um, I think this is something that's very dangerous, and it's dangerous to present it as something partisan. It's dangerous to present it as something Republican versus Democrat. This is truth versus lies, and that's something as American citizens that we should all care about. Governor Walker, um, this would be a good follow-up to you. You were, when you served as governor of Alaska, you were the nation's only independent governor. And last night put on the division of the country in pretty much stark relief, right? But as an independent and the subject of your study group at how do we bridge some of these divides, how did you view last night or any of the processes we've seen which are exposing the tribalism of, that's so much a part of today's politics? You know, having served as, the, as an independent governor, um, I had the um, benefit of seeing what it's like to work not across aisles or just no aisles. So part of last night's what I witnessed was the very beginning when the president refused to shake hands with the Speaker of the House and at the end when the Speaker of the House tore up his speech. I mean, that's about as far apart bookend as you're going to get. And, and then my whole issue is I, I'm not... I'm not anti-party, I just, I just think it needs to be a more level playing field and not quite such a partisan control of the process. The example I use, if somebody walked into a restaurant and hungry, had some, everybody had something else in mind to eat and the menu was given to you and there were two items on the menu. Well, what happened to the rest of the items? Well, somebody else made the decisions about what was going to be on the menu so you could only order one of two things. That's election day and, and I think that's wrong. And so. Um, 
I am very involved in, in looking at a, a solution to the partisan divide. And I certainly think one of them is, is uh, uh, ranked choice voting or instant runoff, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of what happened last night in, in uh, Iowa, so, or two nights ago, sort of, except they did it longhand. Uh, but yeah. on, on instant runoff on the ballot, it all happens on its own, one ballot, and it's done. So I just think we need to, uh, you know, the Constitution says we the people, not we the party. And I think we need to remember that and get back to that. And I think there's a path to get back to that. I feel like I have driven a new test vehicle that no one's driven before, uh, not just as an independent, but to the path to become governor. I went to the, uh, there was a Republican candidate incumbent, well funded by the National Party, and I was a Democratic candidate, and it was me in the middle as independent. So I went to the Democrat uh, candidate for governor and said, why don't you step away and run as my lieutenant governor? In 30 days before the election, he did that. We were called the unity ticket. And so we governed that way. We had a cabinet that was a unity ticket. It looked like Alaska. It didn't look like one party or another party. It wasn't the Republican Full Employment Act or the Democratic Full Employment Act. It was, it was Alaska. So having done that, I came out of that experience a little bit excited about the, you know, like I found the secret sauce recipe that uh, maybe can bring that partisan divide down. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not about eliminating any party. It's about making sure the election process is really controlled by the people and not by the party. Well, Terry, your study group is principal and party. As a conservative, a conservative woman, um, how are you reckoning with some of these issues of, of as you self-describe yourself, a sane conservative? <laughs> well, it's been a challenge, obviously. Um, I've been a conservative my entire adult life in the traditional sen political sense. And what's happening in the Republican Party and what we're witnessing is nothing of the sort. Um, the way this administration has governed is certainly not very um, Republican or conservative. The, some of the economic policies, I mean tax cuts, you have a couple of things that are traditional, but, um, but when you look at the trade, you know, protectionism, that used to be anathema to Republicans. Free, we used to be the free traders. Um, Morality, you know, what happened to the party of family values? Well, that's certainly out the window with this president. Um, you know, uh, just the deficit. I mean, what happened to fiscal responsibility, fiscal conservatism? You didn't even hear one line about the budget deficits, anything like that last night from a Republican president with a pretty healthy economy um, that he inherited. So it's, uh, <laughs> you know, so there's, a, there's so many things that are happening that make my head spin and I go, I, I don't know what's, what, what's going on. But the reason I chose principle versus party as my study topic is because as someone who has been very vocal about um, how problematic Donald Trump has been from the beginning, um, the hypocrisy, the lying, the dishonesty, the lack of decency, all of the things, the litany of transgressions that this man represents, that I thought the party where we used to stand would have never allowed this to happen. The party 20 years ago would never put up, put up with this, but it's unrecognizable now. So um, it has been quite the journey to be an outspoken vocal opponent of Trump, which has put me in opposition of the party. And I'm, you know, persona non grata. If I were to walk into a, a, a Republican event, like I've been to six Republican conventions since every convention since 1996. If I were to walk into that convention this year, I don't know if I would feel safe there. And that is a sad state of affairs. Um, and I think that it's important for people, and Bill uh, and I have talked about this, uh, the people who feel politically homeless now because what we're seeing going on is so outside the, the, the conventional wisdom. There's a lot of people in this country that aren't on either, in either tribe, and where do they go? So, um, you know, I think it's important to make sure that we encourage people to speak up because as one of my historic heroes, Ida B. Wells said, in order to right the wrongs, you have to shine the light of truth upon them. And it takes people to speak up and stand on principle to do that. So I've come to understand in the, the several days you've now been here in Cambridge with us that you two go back. Yeah, yeah. 20 years. <laughs> 20 she years. booked me, I think. Were you working for BET? I now? was. Yeah, so yeah. The, the first time I ever stepped foot in front of a cable news camera was in 1998 during the Clinton impeachment. 
coincidentally, um, as a Republican in favor of Clinton's impeachment at the time. And it was BET News, uh, BET Tonight with Tavis Smiley. It was my first And foray. you booked her. And I, well, not in 98, not there, in 2000, oh, I um, started booking her. So you've had this friendship. For yes. Time, yeah. Yes. But your politics are not... Our politics are very different, but when I was a booker, I was a producer, I did everything behind the camera. When I started um, doing on-air stuff, Tara was one of the... We don't agree on anything, me and Tara. <laughs> Tara was one of the first people to email me and say, I'm so happy to see you step from behind the shadows and, you know, mm. be in front of the camera. Um, we argue all the time, but I love Tara. I love and then Tara. We go to brunch. Yeah. And we go to brunch, and you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep going. Um, <laughs> so I, we want to get out to questions, but I want to give everyone here an opportunity to give a little overview of your study group. So maybe we'll just go right down the. Sure. So, just give um, so I kind of answered in, in the first question, but my study group will be focused on representation in media with the subtext of lack thereof. And we, um, the theme or the thesis rather is um, when you whitewash the American experience, you destroy democracy at the same time. I think it should be a place and a landscape to be inclusive and inviting, and that's not the case now. And so I will um, sprinkle my own personal story throughout the um, study group and my path in media. I'll draw on some historical context and invite um, students and participants to share their methods on how they consume media, um, if they feel heard, if they feel left out, what things are being discussed that resonate with them, and what things that um, are not being discussed that make them feel left out. So I hope you guys will come to all of these study groups because I'm excited about mine, but I'm also equally excited about my colleagues. That's great. Mark? So we'll look at defending democracy here for 2020 and beyond. And what I'd really like to do is uh, give you guys a sense of what it's like to be in the Situation Room, having to pull together interagency and interdisciplinary teams to help solve uh, problems that are at uh, a nexus of events that we just haven't seen before. The, the threat environment we face today is more complex and dynamic than anything in any of our lifetimes and we have to pull within government on various levers of law enforcement, homeland security, diplomacy, defense in our intelligence community, uh, and that's not enough. We also have to bridge out to our private sector, uh, to our technology providers, we have to bridge out to our nonprofit uh, communities, we have to bridge out to the media uh, to understand how to be informed consumers of information in a landscape where we have uh, threats to our elections, uh, running from malign influence to actual interference on administering our elections. So it's a complex topic. We're going to break it down piece by piece, try to frame the issues out, and figure out how we come to reasonable and effective solutions. Awesome. He's got good Air Force One stories. <laughs> <laughs> and I can make cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as I uh, answered previously, my study group topic is principal versus party, and um, I made sure I talked to Senator Mitt Romney today to explain to him that thank you very much for putting principal over party as he was the only Republican to vote properly and vote his conscience um, to remove the President of the United States in the impeachment. Um, I didn't really talk to Mitt Romney, but uh, it, just, it happened to work out that way. Um, and that's a perfect example of where it's um, not easy to go against the grain. It's not easy to do that. A lot of people don't like controversy. They don't like to um, have to explain themselves. And you know, a lot of people would rather just be quiet and walk away, but we can't do that. You know, Martin Luther King said, you know, the ultimate measure of a man is not how he behaves in a time of comfort. It's in a time of challenge and controversy. And that's you know, what Mitt Romney did today, however you felt about him before, was certainly an act of profile and courage um, that I wish more of uh, the Republicans would have taken. So throughout my study group, um, I'm going to focus on different areas of, um, of the way that we not only consume information, um, how the kind of the behavior that has that leads people to make these decisions to be um, loyal to a party or feel as though that they are so adamant to be a part of something the kind of cult of personality that is um, uh, emerged during the era of Trump um, 
the kind of uh, attack on truth. There's a lot of deception going on and a lot of disinformation that we're facing. So we're gonna tackle some of those topics, and, you know, not only domestic disinformation, but internationally, and how that's manipulating our behavior as voters. Because if you don't know what truth is and you don't trust sources, how do you make informed decisions? Um, so we'll be talking about lots of those things and um, hopefully encouraging the, the silent majority of people who would like to speak out um, and believe in their principles and be encouraged to, to, to do that. And uh, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, actually, it's important to speak up. Ambassador. Um, as, uh, as has been said, I spent 40 years in the, in the Foreign Service. Obviously, I started when I was about five. And um, there has never been a time like the last five years. Obviously, in my own country, Brexit is, uh, is a huge change. Um, and unlike elections, which come and go, um, Brexit is forever. Uh, so the political landscape in, in the UK has changed dramatically uh, and permanently. But if you look across Europe, particularly with the rise of certain political parties, the European landscape has changed as well. Then if you go the other way across the Atlantic, I think there are some clear parallels, some differences too, but some clear parallels between Brexit and what happened in the 2016 election. Indeed, your current president described his election as Brexit plus, 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 so he sees it too. And um, this, this change that has swept across Western democracies, for want of a better word, this wave of populism, um, I think is, uh, is an extraordinary phenomenon. I'm not saying whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. What I'd want to try and understand through our study session process, learning from and putting my ideas forward, but also learning from the students who will be with me, is where are the roots? What are the causes of this? Why have the mainstream political parties suffered so much in the last few years? Why have establishments um, across these democracies had their views and their advice rejected quite so strikingly? So for me, it's the most important and dramatic change of my career, and I need to and want to understand better quite what is going on, and maybe from that uh, will emerge some ideas about how mainstream politics and mainstream politicians can re-establish themselves, but let's see. Awesome. Rahini? Um, hi, uh, my study group will be um, on Capitol Hill to the campaign trail, um, and I think grappling with certainly the different paths for people in terms of the roles on both. It'll span, um, I've been on Capitol Hill and involved in Senate campaigns and presidential campaigns over the last 15 years um, and giving people a sense of the different roles, but also um, when people are in the rooms behind the scenes and serving as trusted advisors to whoever it may be, no matter what party you're in, how do you um, do this with integrity while also um, balancing political realities in front of you um, and, and that role of leadership and how all of us can be leaders no matter their place in the room um, and working through that in conversations with the students. That's great. Governor? <clears throat> you know, when I first uh, came up with the, the topic of bridging the partisan divide, I did not realize how wide it was until I saw last night and saw how much wider it got. And, and I like that. I like a challenge. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I've, I've bungee jumped. I've, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a downhill <laughs> ski racer and, and I've, I've done a lot of crazy things. So here I am again doing bridging the partisan divide. But I think it, it really comes down to is, is what, the, what the priorities are. I'm going to uh, have a discussion. I want to learn as much as I'm going to give uh, to this in this institution, in this location. It's going to be a discussion about is there a better way? I think there is. I think there's some things that can be done uh, without taking anything away from anybody, but just putting more, more power in the, in the hands of the individual, individual voters where you don't have to be one or the other. You can just be an American and, and, and be okay. And so 
So I want to have that discussion. Some of my guests will include Senator Lisa Murkowski uh, from Alaska. She is a person that um, I've known for a long time. I know her family, her father when he was in the, in the Senate and then governor, uh, who is, has broken from the party lines a number of times. She voted against the, uh, the Affordable Care Act and uh, voted against the repeal of it. A uh, lot of pressure on her, a lot of pressure on me as, a, as governor to tell her what to do. And, and she and I have a very good relationship. We don't tell each other what to do, but we see we're aligned on a lot of things. So she was, she was no, she was not going to uh, roll back the Affordable Care Act, the Obama uh, uh, health care. She voted against uh, Justice Kavanaugh, uh, which is a big break from the, uh, from the, uh, from the party that she's, she's part of. Um, she ran as a write-in uh, uh, for her seat after her party abandoned her, and she was, as they called, uh, she was primaried. Uh, that's the threat that they hang over. So, so she'll be here to, uh, to talk about her experience. I'm going to give her a little bit of time to get through what the, what's been going on and, and uh, catch her breath a bit. But, uh, so she will be one. Uh, Catherine Gell will be one uh, a speaker as well. She is a, uh, a president of Gell Foods uh, and a very prominent, prominent um, um, advocate on the ranked choice voting. Uh, Alaska, you only get ranked choices on our part of the world by doing it by initiative uh, because the legislature certainly isn't going to do that because there's too many party partisan in influence. So it's going to be on the ballot in Alaska this year, the ranked choice voting, and I think it's going to pass and she's going to be part of that. So she'll be here talking about what that's like and how that's worked. I know the Massachusetts is familiar with that. So um, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to having this, this dialogue and, and discussion. Um, uh, I don't really have a, a product to sell. Uh, I'm not actually trying to you know, make a sale, but I am trying to uh, have a, a, a good, uh, lively discussion about what would it look like if, if you went and voted and you could vote for all the candidates uh, in different order and give your, give your preference so your vote really did count. It wasn't just one brand or another brand. It, it, and so I, I, I'm excited about this opportunity. I'm a, I'm a fixer. I like to, I'm, a, I'm a journeyman carpenter. I come from a, a construction background, not a political background, so I like to fix things. And, and I, I'm not saying I'm going to fix the electoral system, but I feel better uh, expressing what I learned in the, in the time I was in politics as, as governor, uh, what it was like working with, uh, with everybody equally rather than, oh, you're this or you're that, so you can't, you can't do that. I was in office a month and my scheduler came into my office and she closed the door. I thought she was going to quit. She'd never done that before. She closed the door, sat down. I said, what's up, Janice? She said, uh, Governor, the election's over. You don't have to meet with all these people. And I said, I do meet, need to meet with all these people. I wanted to meet with them before I became governor and, I want to meet, and they want to meet with me now and we're going to continue, continue this pace the entire time. And I did because I didn't have to divide them up about who was with me and who was against me. My base was every, every voter. It wasn't a base I was trying to protect. It was uh, the base was every voter out there absolutely equally, whether you're the head of the Republican Party or head of the uh, Democratic Party or you're a labor, uh, you know, working on a job and you thought could be done safer. Everybody got the same amount of time and attention. And that's what you get to do when you don't have to be tied to and, and do the and, and tow a party line. So that's going to be a lively discussion. And I think we're, our guests are going to be uh, uh, will add to that discussion. So I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, you can see why we're really excited for this group of fellows. And now we invite your questions. There's microphones here and up in the balconies. And as is our custom here, please just identify yourself and, uh, and keep it to a question. I think you might have someone up there. We have Mike right there. We'll start. Why don't we start right here? We'll work our way around here. We're going to start right with you. Oh, here. Hi, uh, my name is Arvin. I'm a first year with the college. Um, this question is particularly oriented towards the ambassador and Mr. Harvey. Um, I was wondering, so uh, Mr. Ambassador, you mentioned that the past five years have been some of the craziest years of your 45 year life and 40 year tenure. Um, <laughs> I, I was wondering what scares the both of you just in terms of the foreign policy sphere about the next five years. I know in the beginning of January, uh, the world was really at its toes about whether we or not we were going to war with Iran. I know that there's a lot going on with China. Uh, which one of these issues really, uh, given your experience, hmm. kind of pops out to you and what should, be we, what should we be wary of? Yeah. And the same question to Mark as well. Yeah. Um, my government objected to or disagreed with this administration on 
at least two of the very important big decisions have been taken. One was the withdrawal from the Iran deal, um, and the other was the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Change Agreement. There are other more technical issues like the imposition of tariffs on our um, exports of steel and aluminium that we also were not thrilled about. But if you're looking for something that is a more existential worry, since the Second World War, under American leadership, but you know, with strong support and quite a big role from the UK, we developed a series of post-war multilateral institutions, United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, NATO, and not with the UK at the beginning, the European um, Union, which this administration does not seem to put it, to put it diplomatically, entirely committed to. Um, the president has said, it's not like it's, it's a private thing, he says publicly that he believes that um, that NATO is flawed, and he has a point, by the way, that the European allies aren't paying enough for NATO, uh, not paying their 2% of their GDP they've, they've promised to do, but, um, but nevertheless, we would prefer it if the president were more, were more I mean, the pressure on, on others to, to pay their fair share is right, but more support in public for the extraordinary contribution that NATO has made to post Know, to the last 40, 50 years of security and stability and prosperity in Europe, in the North Atlantic area, you know, be good to have more recognition of that. Um, and if you look at international institutions, um, the WTO, which again, this administration doesn't seem massively keen on the World Trade Organization. Uh, if you believe in um, the value of free trade, and you believe that free trade is one of the things that has produced all the economic, or played a big part in the economic success, prosperity we've had in recent decades, then the fact that the administration is not, is basically stopping the, uh, the court, the appellate court in, in, the, in, the, in the WTO from functioning by not allowing new judges to be nominated is a problem. So if you want to put that in a kind of a big picture way, um, who knows who will win your next election, but whoever it is, we hope will be a company that 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 um, you know, that uh, in the next U.S. administration, the continuation of this one or a different party, will reaffirm um, U.S. support, wholehearted and committed support for these institutions, which have served us extraordinarily well, actually, for the last 50, 60 years, and which, by the way, we remind you all, were largely an American design and construction. So these are your. These are your post-war institutions that have delivered brilliantly for all of us and that are precious and that need to be, need to be supported. That's, I think, you know, if there's one worry I would identify, it's that. Those post-war institutions have done amazing things. Uh, they rebuilt Europe. They established and enforced a doctrine of deterrence that saw us through a Cold War without cataclysmic uh, conflict. Uh, they pivoted to wage a war on terrorism. And today they have to address the rise of great power competition, uh, especially Russia and China. Um, definitely a focus on China uh, in, in certain ways, uh, Russia and, and other threat vectors there. Uh, but both of those mean that the asymmetric threat to our critical infrastructure here at home and with our allies abroad is now becoming uh, the predominant threat of our age that we have to be able to, to address. Uh, and for the first time, in our nation's history, really, or really since the War of 1812. Uh, the homeland is a contested environment. Our adversaries are here. Our adversaries are working to understand us uh, and how our critical infrastructure operates and to identify our soft underbelly and be able to utilize their ability to disrupt that, uh, to hold us at risk and to bend us to their will. That is new for us to be able to deal with. In, our, in the institutions in the international sphere, that we've utilized in the past 70 years have not adapted to that yet. Our homeland institutions have not adapted to that yet. We haven't uh, really publicized that through the media or made that a predominant conversation. We are behind the curve. And I think that is probably the most dangerous thing for us right now is just realizing uh, 
that we are, that frog in the pot of uh, water that's heating up and a couple of those bubbles are starting to form right now. Uh, we're running out of time to be able to address that. Good. Thank you both. Go right up here. Wait. Oh, okay, it's on. All right. Um, well, hello, and thank you all for like the diverse range of experiences each of y'all have brought. Um, my question is uh, mainly towards uh, Ms. Tiffany. Um, hold on. Sure, I'm kind of nervous. Oh, I'm Nadia. <laughs> I'm a first year at the college uh, studying social studies. Um, and my question is, how do you navigate projecting voices of communities you don't personally um, identify with as someone from a mixed background um, and an immigrant family, but also um, a poorer family? It's always been um, a goal of mine to project voices around me to support my communities, but also those who I don't identify with as I see them as an allyship. Um, and after reading the beat, I noticed that that seems to be a goal as well. Um, so just your perspective on that over the years. Sure, and thank you for the question. So I've actually worked um, alongside and within a lot of different communities of color. I spent some time at the National Education Association mm -hmm. doing minority community outreach and organizing. Um, I needed a break from cable news, as you can imagine. Um, and so I worked with uh, Native American, Alaskan, and Native communities, the Latinx community, and the Asian American Pacific Islander community, in addition to the black community. And um, the one thing that I found is people were incredibly welcoming. Uh, because they were so happy to be seen and heard. And, you know, these were not communities from where I came, but they still, there was some commonality in not feeling seen or heard. And it's funny because we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, that you don't have to be of that community to be an ally. And we're barreling towards a majority-minority country, right? And so sometimes there's discord among all of our communities. There's discord among communities of color. There's discord among disenfranchised, financially disenfranchised um, white communities. And we we all have some of the same issues and we all have to work together and so I've been blessed and gifted with people um, who are very welcoming and inviting and I did more listening than, than speaking um, because you know again while it's not about the faces you see on television um, we still don't see a lot of Native American representation or Asian American representation or Latinx representation. A lot of the conversations around diversity um, are in black and white, uh, figurative, figuratively and literally. So um, I try to represent those interests where I can with respect and always remembering that I am a guest of some of these cultures, not a member of it. So I wanna honor that all the time by uplifting their voices. And let me just say, I have some great speakers um, of, 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 of mixed backgrounds. Soledad O'Brien is one of the speakers who's coming. And as you know, she's Cuban, African-American, um, and also Irish. So um, she's somebody who represents a lot of these communities as well. So thank you for the question. And I hope that you'll come to all of these study groups um, because we'll be talking a lot about the different communities and how there can be more representation. Excellent. Thank you. We'll go. Uh, good evening. Joe Azrak, uh, good evening. Uh, Joe Azrak, Advanced Leadership Initiative Fellow. Uh, it seems to me, and this is for anyone who would care to address it, um, three of the major challenges for the next administration uh, are and will be climate change, uh, uh, income and wealth inequality, and the extraordinary economic and social power of the so-called fangs, Facebook, Amazon, et cetera. Um, if you were uh, advising the next uh, U.S. administration, uh, what guidance would you give them in addressing each of these challenges? Thank you. Great question. Uh, if I just hop in there, those kind of hit the intersection of, of what we did in resilience and, uh, and how we look toward the future uh, and start to build out uh, communities that are robust and, and flexible and dynamic in the face of those challenges and more. Uh, and frankly, I think there's an interdisciplinary nature that touches on each one of those where uh, it's very easy to go out and address individual communities and think of it as a check the box sort of a list where I've got to go talk to the tech companies and then I've got to talk to the advocacy and I've got to go talk to the housing folks. Uh, but when you're able to draw together uh, those multiple forms of expertise, uh, which we are doing in a number of recovering communities. We have eight large scale recoveries on underway in this country right now from disasters in the last two and a half years where we're spending $150 billion across 90 programs and 20 departments and agencies to synchronize those and bring together grants managers and architects and community planners and developers and tech companies um, really toward a common vision 
uh, is absolutely vital and essential, and we can't stick in those individual stovepipes. Governor, do you want to yeah. add? Yeah, <clears throat> I would add to that that, you know, there are some things that are not partisan issues, should not be partisan issues, and certainly climate change is one. Alaska, we certainly were at ground zero on climate change as a result of the Arctic and, and, and those kinds of issues. So, you know, I just, um, it, it's a matter of recognizing, are these issues greater than one party or another party? And the answer is absolutely they are. And, and so, you know, the, the goal is to uh, somehow uh, uh, sever it from the, the partisan process and go, and go beyond that. Healthcare is a good example. Healthcare is certainly not a, a, should not be a partisan issue. It should be a humanistic uh, American issue and, and not necessarily uh, owned by one party or another party. So, you know, the, the, I mean, my recommendation would be, you know, put together, you know, put together a, a, a team for a solution, but don't, don't pick all, I mean, pick a smattering. I mean, the, the climate change uh, policy advisory committee I, I selected, you know, was, was a, a number of environmental groups, the president of an oil company, you know, a president of, of, of a chamber of commerce. It was, I mean, it was, a, it was just not all, you know, like-minded people to, uh, to address that. So, I mean, if, if you don't, if you're not willing to, to bring it to larger than a particular partisan issue, it'll always remain a partisan issue. And whoever's in the majority will control that, will control that message. I say, you know, some things just are far beyond uh, uh, the partisan lines. And those, those that you mentioned certainly are. Doctor, welcome. Thank you, it's a terrific panel. Um, I just wanted to ask you your, ad your advice to emerging and new democracies. As they watch what we saw with Brexit in the UK, and almost the meltdown uh, in Parliament. We watch what is happening in the United States and the divide that seems to be getting worse and worse. We think about the asymmetric threats that Mark Harvey referred to. You put all this together. You know, new democracies need advice on is democracy going to survive? What would you say to them when they survey the landscape on countries that have been practicing democracy for so long, but seem to be going through an incredibly, incredibly difficult to understand period? What a great question. And it's the whole panel. Yeah, what a great question. Mm -hmm. Who would like to kick us off? Tara? I'll, I'll start on that one. Um, today we had lunch with the mayor of Athens and he talked about, you know, we, we all know that the concept of democracy started in Greece many moons ago, and um, he mentioned that some things are just bigger than a legacy. They're big, they're, the ideals of, of certain things are just, uh, will, are everlasting. And I think that the ideals of democracy will survive what's happening now as long as there are engaged people who say that what's happening right now is not normal. Um, democracy is worth fighting for. And we have to uh, make sure that people are informed, they understand what happens. This can be the case study in what happens when people, uh, you allow certain groups to um, not be held accountable or you know, run amok and other people are complacent. Complacency is our enemy. Um, so I think that we, we can look at this and say, whoa, we do see, and your, your study group is, if you should go, because his study group is gonna talk all about the rise of populism and these movements in the West, and not only the US and UK, but in Germany and Italy and all these places. And what's happening, it does seem like democracy is under assault, and in ways it is. Um, but it's worth fighting for, and we have to be educated on where, where it has been successful and why it was successful for so long. I mean. John Adams warned that every great democracy eventually commits suicide. <laughs> that was 200 years ago, and uh, I always say, you know, look, right now, we, you know, we've got the knife to the jugular, mm -hmm. but we can put the, put the knife down, and let's talk about how we can, you know, bring 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 it back. But um, I just think that it's important for people to know when when it's successful, where it wasn't, and to take a look at what's happening, understanding what led to this point now, and make the decisions from there. Yes. Um, there's two ways of looking at Brexit. Um, vote was 17 million to 16 million, so it was 
narrow, 52% to 48%, but it was clear that's a big enough margin. It uh, just needed a, a simple majority, and, and it was a little bit bigger than that. You can argue that the following couple of years was um, uh, wrong because Parliament should simply have done as the British people done what the British people voted for and just pushed Brexit through very quickly. It should have all been done and dusted. You can equally argue that this was democracy in action with members of Parliament taking their responsibilities extremely seriously, thinking through the consequences of Brexit because, well, we will see now that there can be some economic consequences since we are potentially moving to a different sort of relationship with the countries with which we, to which we send 40% of our exports there are some risks there which the government will need to work through as it now takes this through. But I think it is not um, unreasonable, in fact, it's actually what you expect of members of parliament to think through all of this, to worry about the consequences, and to look for, as they did, a way of delivering Brexit that minimised all of those. And what eventually you have is basically a parliament in deadlock, which could not agree on a solution because you could never get a majority for any particular form of Brexit. Um, and then you have a general election and you get a new government with an 80 seat majority and it has all gone through now. And that's also democracy in action. Now, you know, there are some very big challenges ahead. Um, negotiated trade deal with the United States, negotiated trade deal with our European, former European partners. Um, negotiating trade deals with the rest of the world, managing all the disentangling that Brexit um, involves. But that argument about delivering the first part of the withdrawal agreement and what happens next has all been fought out in Parliament, not on the streets. And that's a good thing. And this is probably an unfashionable view in some quarters in the UK, but I, um, you know, I thought Parliament, uh, even though it took two years without reaching a decision, these were people taking on the responsibilities and doing their job and worrying about things that they should have worried about. And in the end, the election has, uh, has produced a government with a big enough majority to get it through. And you know, um, whatever you think about Brexit, um, this is actually democracy working, not the opposite. Great. Well, now we go right here. Hello, and thank you all so much for being here this semester. I look forward to working with you all through the Fellows and Study Group program. My name is Victor. I'm a first year here at the college. And my question is um, directed towards Governor Walker, but I'd love to hear uh, what other insights um, the panel has. Um, so I grew up in an age where I've only seen the political divide become larger and larger. Um, and so I would like for you to give us a brief overview of where you think we're coming from and where, in your opinion, you believe that we should be going or headed in the future. On the political divide, is that what, you, is that what you're, you're saying as far as where it's come from and where it's going, it's going to go? Yes. Uh, here, here's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, I was surprised when I became governor. Again, I, you know, we had a law firm for years, and my, my wife and I in the private sector. So I came into government as governor. And um, I was surprised the number of, of, of uh, legislators that would come into my cabinet room and say to me, Governor, we totally agree with the hard decision you're, that you're talking about, you want to do, you want to make, you're absolutely correct. One legislator was in tears and she said this. And I said, well, good, I need your vote and, the, and the, to get it out of committee. She says, oh no, I can never vote for that. I would never get reelected. And I heard that so many times, I had a rule that if you said that, you had to leave my cabinet room. I, I have no patience for that. I think a lot of it comes <coughs> from fear of not being reelected. And if you cross the party, you'll be primaried. And primaried means they will run somebody in the primary against you and the party will support that person and not you and you will lose. So that's, that's I think that it has, I have no patience for that. I absolutely know, because that's one of the most unpatriotic thing you can do to say, my allegiance is to the party, my allegiance is to get reelected. You know, in my state of the state, I said, you know, I ran for this job to do the job, not keep the job. And I would hope that somebody else would have picked that up in, in the legislature. I don't think many of them did, some did. But, you know, it's a matter of, of, of standing up and doing the right thing and not being beholden to a party and not being beholden to a re-election. And so that's, I think, what has caused this because there are many people that have to hold their nose, and I think it took place today, had to hold their nose to vote the way they did, but they know if they did not, 
there would be consequences. There'd be severe, severe consequences. And I think that came out in some of the testimony and some of the, some of the, uh, the case that was made. And, and that's what I think, that's why I am so passionate about leveling the playing field so that one party or the other party doesn't have all that kind of control. And then you are your own person. And then you can make decisions based upon what your, what your heart and your gut tells you to do uh, and, and who you are, not necessarily who you answer to. Because as soon as a person, you know, I always get a kick out of the, the uh, when, the, when people talk in the primary, they don't, they don't know a single person on the other, uh, of the other party. But once they win the primary, oh, they're their best friend because you want to have that, you know, all work across the aisle uh, attitude. That's just wrong. That's just absolutely, they're, 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 so I think, I think it's just the, 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 the partisan divide comes from the, the focus on re-election, and you don't get that without the support of the party. So we have time for a quick question, right up there. Good evening, welcome to the IOP and the Fellows and Study Groups program. My name is Arian, and I am a sophomore at the college studying social studies. My question in particular is aimed at Governor Walker and Ms. Tara. You guys have both talked about times in which you've needed to go against the grain and make decisions as an individual. I was wondering if either of you could elaborate on a specific instance of this, your thought process going into the decision and then the outcome and what you learned from that. Tara? Well, um, for me, it wasn't necessarily one particular instance. It was the culmination of the, the 2016 election. Every time I was called upon to give my commentary on CNN about what was happening in the election, it became apparent that I was not going to fall in line with the, with the Republican Party stance on things. Um, and it just, for me, it felt very natural. I've always been someone unafraid to stand up for what's right. I'm thankful to my mom who taught me that very, very young. My mom was a single parent. She had me at 21. The decision to have me at 21 years old in 1975 was the first going against the norm for um, in my life because it was very, could have been very easy for her to make a different decision and she chose not to. So my entire life, my mom has always instilled in me that it's okay to be a nonconformist. When you see something, say something, stand up for what's right and never be um, bullied into silence. So I've carried that with me in many scenarios over the years um, in politics be because that's not usually how people are. You know, in politics, a lot of people, it's about building coalitions and you have to do all that, but there's a lot of compromise that goes on that sometimes is, uh, you know, difficult to square. And, and to, to the governor's point, you know, people would say, well, this is what I believe is the right thing to do, but I'll never get reelected. Well, you know, the founding fathers expected our governors to be virtuous. They didn't want us to have these kinds of factions and parties. They feared that because of what's happening now. So. I would say that, you know, for me, um, it was the decision once, well, here's another thing, if you want to, one, one decision. When it was time to make the decision who to vote for in 2016, I had many friends who were my Republican friends for 20 years that held their nose and voted for Donald Trump because they just could not stomach a Hillary Clinton presidency. And I said, under no circumstances will I ever cast a ballot for someone that I feel is that against everything I stand for just to make a political point and be part of a party. And I did not cast a vote for, for uh, Donald Trump. I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton either. I voted third party for Evan McMullen, who is um, coming as one of my guests. He was a former CIA operative and ran as an independent candidate. Because I felt as though when people say it's the lesser of two evils, and I'm like, well, if we keep making that decision, then soon what used to be evil is not going to be evil anymore. And I'm not going to be a part of that. I have no obligation, no obligation to involve myself in something I believe will have an immoral outcome. So the decision then to take that stance was probably one of the, um, one of the most uh, challenging at the time because it, it set me against a lot of people who thought that I was uh, an apostate for doing it. But I stood on principle to do it, and unfortunately, Mom, I've turned out to be right. And I, did, <laughs> I used to say, I don't, you know, look, look, people, you guys are taking a chance here. I've never wanted to be more wrong in my life because if I'm right, it's bad for the country. And um, here we are. 
but we can Governor, fix it. we have a little time, but if you could share. <laughs> my uh, really good question. Um, my, you know, I became governor. Uh, Alaska's economy is 90, was 90% dependent upon the price of oil. Mis big mistake, but it was what it was when I came into. It went from over $100 a barrel down to $26 a barrel in about three months. We were losing a half million dollars an hour. $12 million a day is, is what we were losing as far as the deficit, a $4.3 billion deficit with 750,000 people. <clears throat> we had to do some drastic things. I had to do some drastic things as governor. Um, and so I introduced legislation that would, that would do a, uh, we have a $65 billion uh, a sovereign wealth fund it when, and we get a dividend every year from that fund. And so I introduced legislation to uh, modify that to bring it down to $1,000 per person rather than the $2,000 it was going to be. It was about a $2 billion expenditure. And the Senate uh, voted with me. They, they, they passed that, uh, that bill and, and I went on, on, on down to the gallery and, 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 and watched that happen and thanked them. The House would not and uh, they did not pass it. And so they came to me and they said, we're gonna make you do what you want us to do. So I had a decision to make. Was I gonna do what's good, the worst political suicide anybody can do is to take money from somebody. You, know, you think taxing somebody is one thing? <laughs> you take money from them. It's a whole different level of discussion, I gotta, I gotta tell you. And, and even in my own family around the dinner table, I said, Dad, you did what? <laughs> um, uh, but I did, I, I vetoed the dividend down to $1,000. And because it had to be done, and, 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 I, and I did. That was the hardest decision. It was hard for me, not because of the political consequences, because I knew how it, it was, it, how it, it would impact the lowest level of income of uh, residents of Alaska who really needed that additional $1,000. And so that was a difficult part for me, but it was for the longevity of that fund. If we spent that fund down, then there'd be zero dividends out in the future. So that was the most difficult decision I've ever made but it wasn't, the, the difficulty wasn't a political, it was a fiscal impact on, on the lower income that, that I was challenged with. Great questions and really thoughtful answers all around. Well, join me in thanking our fellows. <laughs> a great group. We, uh, we invite all of you to participate in their study groups here at the Institute of Politics and for our students that are here, we invite you down to Wexner Commons where we'll have a open house, you'll get to meet the fellows and learn more about the whole panoply of programs here at the Institute of Politics. Thank you for all for joining us tonight.